Hi, my name is Zach Cachero. I'm the computer science grad student on this project. And the way that I fit into this biosensor chip is through data analysis and essentially how to make sense of all the data that's coming off of the chip. So today we're going to talk about sensors in general and how they're used in uh, science experiments. So, first question is, what is a sensor? And as you can probably guess based on the word alone, it's anything that can sense changes in the environment around it. And usually we're talking about a specific attribute such as temperature or light or some specific chemical. And the environment might be the room around you or it might be a chemical solution or in an electric circuit or in the case of the biosensor chip, it'll be a tissue slice. We can also say that our human body is made up of a variety of different senses. And everybody knows about the five different senses, um, but there's also plenty more. But that means that our eyes, our nose, our ears, our tongue, and our skin are all different sensors. But the main problem with this is that our observations are subjective and unreliable. And there's also plenty of different things around you that you're not able to sense, such as infrared light or ultraviolet light or high frequency pitches or the voltage in an electric circuit or even the amount of oxygen in the air around you. Here's a classic optical illusion that shows how our senses can be tricked. Uh, in this picture, the smaller red and green boxes are actually the same color even though it doesn't appear like it. And that's just because our eyes use the context of the uh, colors around them in order to draw conclusions. So this just underscores the importance of having a reliable sensor and the fact that we need to collect quantitative data rather than qualitative data. So an ideal sensor, in order to be as accurate as possible, should be extremely sensitive to the particular attribute that we're observing and insensitive to any other changes in the environment. And sometimes this is easier said than done. So when we run an experiment, we need to be able to reliably observe the changes in the independent variable in order to draw some conclusions from this. And we want to have some quantitative data so that we can perform a statistical analysis on the data and if we want to uh, build some mathematical models from this. So when talking about sensors that produce quantitative data, they can still fall into two different categories those that are electronic and produce an electric signal, and those which rely on some sort of physical property, such as a mercury thermometer or pressure gauge. Uh, from now on, we'll focus on just electronic sensors because they have several different advantages. Uh, for one, there's no human error when reading off the values, and also they allow for automatic data collection, which helps out if you're running many different repeated experiments uh, and collecting all that data. And it also allows us to do some analysis as we're collecting the data uh, during the experiment. And this is called online analysis. So now I'll talk to you about some different types of sensors and the different attributes that they can detect. So here we have several different categories that they can fall into, although there are more. We have acoustic, optical, magnetic, electric, thermal, biological, chemical, and mechanical properties. And for some specific examples, there's the ammeter, which detects the amount of current in a circuit. Uh, the infrared temperature sensor is able to monitor the temperature based on the infrared radiation coming off of an object. Uh, you're probably familiar with the accelerometer from a Nintendo Wii remote. And the metal detector detects changes in the magnetic field. A microphone picks up on sound waves. A photoresistor is able to monitor changes in the uh, light around it. A sonar fish finder uses acoustic waves in order to locate fish. A piezoelectric pickup uses a material that's able to create an electric signal based on the compression of that material. So it's able to pick up on the vibrations of the instrument. A carbon monoxide detector just actively monitors the carbon monoxide in the air and the particle detector from the Large Hadron Collider at CERN is a good example of how research and science has pushed the development of new and more complex types of sensors. So there's a special category of sensors called biosensors which are used to measure some sort of analyte in the body 
And probably the most common one that you've heard of is the blood glucose meter, which is used by diabetics to monitor their blood sugar levels. And this uses an electrochemical reaction, which uses an enzyme to catalyze a reaction for glucose, and essentially produces a small current, which the sensor picks up on, depending on the levels of glucose in the blood. And the biosensor chip that we're all developing uses a very similar principle with an electrochemical reaction, only it's monitoring neurotransmitters over a small area on a brain tissue slice. And this will give us a good idea for how cells communicate with each other and also how the brain develops under different conditions. So I mentioned this biosensor chip several times now, and that's not just some shameless self-promotion of our project, but it really illustrates the last point. And that's the fact that new technology and advances in engineering allow us to develop new types of sensors. And with these new types of sensors, we might be able to observe something that was completely unobservable before. And with this new type of data that we get from it, we can run some new experiments and draw conclusions from those experiments. And eventually this will lead to some new discoveries in that field. So, in the end, the development of new types of sensors are pretty essential and will continue to push the boundaries of where science can go.